Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell story, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. This week, we're going to be focusing on the uh, new adventure series, The Mosquito Coast, from Apple TV+. We're joined today by the showrunner and creator of the show, Neil Cross, as well as the supervising sound editor and the re-recording mixer, Ron Bokar. This show is a reimagining of the Paul Theroux novel starring his nephew, Justin Thoreau. It's not to be confused with the amazing 1986 film uh, that was derived from the same novel starring Harrison Ford and directed by Peter Weir. So what changes were made to the original source material in order to kind of expand upon it and reimagine it for this TV series? And why are those themes still relevant to a contemporary audience? Let's dive in and find out. Neil and Ron, thank you guys so much for, for joining us to talk about Mosquito Coast. It was a great experience watching this show. Uh, I was really, uh, especially having you know, remembered the original film, uh, you really took us on some very different uh, directions uh, with this. Well, I've got a lot of questions uh, for the both of you about how you work together and how you collaborated on this pretty remarkable show. But before we get into that, I wanted to just back up a little bit, Neil, and ask you about the genesis of the project and, and how it originated. Obviously, um, it's starting uh, with the, the Paul Thoreau novel. And did it come to you through Justin or how did this how did all this come together? Uh it came to me via corporate machinations is the story. Uh, uh, the truth is I hesitate to use the term because it makes me sound like Annie Wilkes, but I can't think of a better alternative. I'm a, I'm a lifelong fan of Paul Theroux. I started reading Paul Theroux's books when I was 14, I guess. I read The Great Railway Bazaar first and then Mosquito Coast. And since then, um, I've read and reread and sometimes re re reread pretty much everything he's ever written. So he's been a very important kind of narrative voice to me um, as I grew up and through my adult life. Um, moreover, if there is on the face of the planet a bigger fan of Harrison Ford than me, then I have yet to meet them. Uh, and if and if somebody does stake the claim. I will face them in one-on-one -on -one gladiatorial combat for the crown. Um, so as far as I was concerned, in terms of kind of a straight adaptation of that novel, the definitive straight adaptation already existed in Peter Weir's film, 1985, 86. Um, so my friend and colleague at, at Fremantle, North America, uh, Dante Di Loretto, knowing that I was a big fan of Paul Theroux, uh, approached me one day and said, you know, hey, what about the Mosquito Coast? Uh, to which I said an immediate no, under no circumstances. Um, and Because you felt that it had been done and done very well exactly. already. It had been done, it had been done very well already. And, and I knew, moreover, there's a kind of, there's a function of cowardice in there as well, because I, I had a kind of lifelong, you know, distant, completely distant, but nevertheless still quite emotional relationship with Paul Theroux. I knew his voice. And I'm acutely aware that um, adaptation is the world's most redundant euphemism. That, that actually the process of transferring a, a written text to the screen is, is one of consensual violence. And, you know, you have to emotionally disengage from the machine which exists on the page and you have to disassemble it and you have to hammer some bits and throw other bits out you have to flatten it you have to burn it you have to bury it in the garden um and on a on a kind of purely kind of human level i didn't want to piss off paul theroux uh, i was i was scared you know you don't want to be you don't want to be disliked or disrespected as a vulgarian by somebody that you've respected for your entire life. Uh, so Fremantle, uh, Dante at Fremantle kind of interrogated this fear in me. And in much the way I've subsequently come to realize that, you know, that police officers get a much better result when they're interrogating suspects by being kind and empathetic than they do by banging the tail. Um, uh, the the interrogation progressed 
uh, such that it was kind of, you know, explain to me the nature of your concerns. Why are you concerned? Okay, and okay, so then what would you, having understood my concerns, what would you do to approach that? How would you change it? How would you ameliorate that? And of course, and in the process of beginning to explain how in a theoretical world you would do it, you've already begun. So I was, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was kidnapped into it. It was, it was, it was a very gentle psychological kidnap. Well, how did you light on this, you know, this, this kind of this new engine for the story, which is running from, you know, Ali running from his past in this, in this very specific way that he does in the show. And I'm kind of curious, what was, what was, what was Paul's reaction <laughs> to that when, when he found out what you wanted to do? Well, my secret conceit, which I can now, you know, share with the world. Um, is that uh, on a purely narrative level that we would take an approach that was completely the opposite of what The Handmaid's Tale did, for instance, where they started with an adaptation of the novel. Well, Big Little Lies, I guess, the same thing. They, you start with the novel and then expand the world. So we're starting in the expanded universe and we are moving towards, it's, it's you know, I don't want to, stretch the metaphor past the point of, of excruciation, but we are on a journey to the Mosquito Coast. So it's still our destination. It's still where we are headed in terms of the story. Um, but as to the specifics of those, uh, of those decisions, my, I had two big anxieties. The primary one is that Ali in the book, like all great literary creations, I mean, this is irrespective of, of, of Harrison Ford, looking extremely cool in that Hawaiian shirt and that cool hat. Um, irrespective of Peter Weir's movie, the character in the novel, like all great literary creations, exists on two levels. And there's, there's one level of Ali Fox in the novel who is an exemplar of a particular American archetype, of the American contrarian, the contrarian individualist, uh, the, the kind of uh, the American man, and it's always a man, um, whose basic political philosophy is an extended middle finger. And that could, you know, it could be Joey Ramone or, you know, Randall McMurphy or Yasseri. Uh, but as to the specifics of that character, the book was written in the late 70s, early 80s. So Ali Fox in early middle age at that time um, exists in a very particular set of political, economic, um, cultural and social circumstances. It's post Vietnam, it's post the oil shock, it's post um it's post Watergate. It's called Watergate, yeah. Uh um and he's really part of that disenfranchised hippie libertarian generation to which ironically Steve Jobs himself belonged. Um but that is 40 years ago now. Um and so the first challenge was to imagine who that guy would be if he lived in the world now, who who would exemplify all of those qualities in such a way that it's not some kind of half hearted attempt simply to copy and paste from one time frame to another. So that was challenge number one. And challenge number two was that uh, Paul through is, is a, a fantastically adept and skilled novelist and there is a for there's a literary device such that you can deploy a form of irony which on the page is a form of deeper comment so in the novel ali's wife is not blessed with so much as a name she's just called mother she has no agency she has and and that's paul's way of commenting on the fact that you know that there's a kind of nascent jim jones in ali and he doesn't want equals. He doesn't want partners. He wants a congregation. He wants a following. And even back 30 cough years ago, when Peter Weir did his film, um, that element of the story was the least satisfactory of the movie. You've got Helen Mirren playing a character called Mother. Um, so if it didn't work well for two hours, 30 cough years ago it's certainly not going to work for 10 20 30 hours you know in 2021 so the second question was who the hell is this woman why the hell is she married to this man why do they live the way they live 
And it was just those two very fundamental questions around which, you know, that a story begins to, to froth and boil. And the notion, the simple notion that, okay, they're not just running to something because running, running to something is a, is, uh, an emotion, I think, that which we all to some extent experience and it's endemic to America's sense of itself that we're a, we're a migratory species since we left Africa. We're always going to the next hill, the next lake, the next pasture. It's, it's in us. But on screen, it's not a fundamentally dramatic drive. So as well as having the pull of the better place, I want to have a, a push. And that, that led to some of the story decisions we took. So I, I want to talk just a little bit about Justin Thoreau's uh, performance, uh, which is just re remarkably courageous. Uh, you touched on this a little bit, Neil. But, you know, in many ways, Ali is not a particularly sympathetic character. Um, he's incredibly charismatic and we want to follow him and we're deeply engaged in what he's doing. But at the same time, he puts his family in a lot of jeopardy uh, with his uh, antics as he goes through the show. And I'm kind of curious, like, how did you find kind of the sweet spot of keeping that character very charismatic and vibrating and alive, but not letting him get so almost you know, sociopathic <laughs> that the audience gives up and says, Ugh, I don't, you know, I, I don't like this guy. Um, antics is a great word. I wish I'd have, I'd have deployed the word antic before. Um, there's, there's a, a really simple answer to that. And, and the answer is Justin Thoreau. Thoreau. We have a Thoreau and a Thoreau, even though they're related. It, get, it gets very confusing. Um, and, you know, uh, Nearly called him Ali. Uh, <clears throat> Justin is blessed with immense charisma and likability, but he's also blessed with immense intelligence and skill as an actor. Because Ali's a lot, um, and kind of getting the gauge right such that we are never sick of the sight of him. It, it was a, a very, very fine line to walk. And we had a, a conversation in the early days and, and the, the basic rule of thumb is that Ali's an asshole, but he's never a prick. And so we, we just have to keep the prick meter from going into the red. And really that was determined by Justin's uh, skill, insight and intelligence rather than mine. And, and he, he's got this great ability to uh, to interrogate speech and sometimes change a key word in speech such that it rescues Ali from the prick cliff. I've just invented a term. Ron, how did you get involved in this show? You're, you know, I've known your work for years, but it's uh, usually in the context of a pretty, uh, you know, of, of studio films uh, and independent feature films. and. Uh, how did you come on board uh, this kind of extended uh, television project? Um, I had done a couple of seasons of uh, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. So I had done some series work already. And uh, it came through um, Christina, uh, our, 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 our post supervisor, uh, with a request for, are you interested? Are you, you, know, are you available for this kind of thing? Um, my company and, and one of my partners had had a connection with uh, Rupert Wyatt, one of the directors. And I think that was our introduction, um, at least into being able to be considered for the show. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, it was such a departure for me to work on in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's where I kind of fit in, I think. Well, the thing that's exciting to me about this is, you know, Ron, I'm sure you can probably say the same. I think when when we started in the business, the quality difference between feature films and television was huge. And now it's, you know, it, the television has, so it, it, especially in a sound perspective. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, what really excited you about working on this show? And, uh, you know, I'm sure that budget and schedule is always a challenge, but what, what, what was it that really kind of made you want to say, yes, I really want to do this. It is. Um, and that was, you know, part of the intrigue is how to pull this one off with the kind of schedule that we had and with the kind of budget that we had. And uh, it was all very respectful on paper 
And, you know, we stuck to a lot of the paper, believe it or not. It was a, a well-produced, well-organized show, um, even with our huge interruption because of COVID, which we can talk about as a whole separate thing. But, um, you know, when I first was brought in on it, I, I kind of realized that it, it resembled a chase film over the course of X amount of episodes. You know, it starts as a chase and it continues. Every episode has them moving through some different areas, moving through a different city, moving through a desert, moving through whatever. It was a constant, constant project in motion. And again, th this is before I saw any of it. This was just like looking at some scripts and um, not knowing where it was going to go. I never read any of the last half of what the season was going to be. And I know that all changed anyway, also because of you know COVID. But um, it, it, how do you describe it? it each episode uh, kind of presented itself as this rubber band that you just kind of like start stretching and stretching. And sooner or later, you just snap. And that snap is a big snap. And it's a painful snap. <laughs> and then it starts up all over again. And sometimes within one episode, you'll have many times where that's going on. And the performances reflect that. The editing seemed to reflect that. The action scenes seemed to reflect all that. Everything kind of, every episode is kind of structured in that same kind of way uh, with different things happening all the time. So um, I looked at it as a nice big challenge. And, um, and it was, but it, it was like one of those rewarding challenges that you finished every episode and went, yeah. That's great. <laughs> you know. And then you go and lie down and stare at the sea. Yeah, yeah. 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 You, you, then, then you take a little bit of a rest. <laughs> well, I especially, uh, we talk a lot on this show about tone and how storytellers create tone. And, and I love, you know, from the very opening sequence of, the, of episode one, which is that kind of bonkers animation as, as we're in the ice making machine and we come out and then we, we meet alley for the first time i just love that I, I love the way of using that that image and sound to kind of put the audience in this you know basically strap them in and tell them you're going to go in for a wild ride with this show so it must have been a, a lot of fun for you to, to figure that out oh yeah yeah and we kept getting variations of it throughout the entire show <laughs> so, so it, was, it didn't it never really gelled and came together until the very end well, of that episode part of part of uh Ron's endless patience was continually to pull me back from the very edge of bad taste. <laughs> it's like, how, how, how far can we push this? I just, I, you couldn't, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we, we went, we went we, far. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about, so I, you guys are laughing and joking, but I'm curious, like, what is your working relationship and how did you collaborate as the post-production on the show went? went on and Ron, were you involved in, in production at all or did you come on after no not at all i i was involved in post i mean the only production connection would have been rupert in the beginning because he happens to live uh on the east coast so he would be able to at least come down and visit um and and it seemed in the beginning that that was going to be more of a connection because neil is down in where New Zealand, right? So it, you know, it was trying to do this integration of how are we going to put, you know, the the world that we have on this show into a uh, conversation. And uh, as as it played out, uh, you know, Neil, we would get on the spotting sessions, and you know. Uh, some weird time. I think you would have just woken up <laughs> and we would be signing on late afternoon um, in order to, uh, to, to spot a session, to spot a, uh, to spot an episode. And uh, that was basically the foundation of it. And then we would, we would do our mix, uh, send off a version of it, get Neil's notes do Neil's notes and then send that off to Fremantle and Apple and then wait for notes from them and uh, run, run them by Neil to make sure everybody was going to be on the same page and implement them and finish the episode. That was the way we ended up doing it. Um, and I'm mixing in Atmos and no one ever heard those mixes because we would keep crashing them down to a two track 
and sending them off for people to listen to. I'm sure that that must be a little bit of a heartbreak because, you know, you never know what they're going to be. Are they going to be listening on an iPad with, uh, you know, earbuds in or how, Neil, how did you, uh, I presume that you probably didn't have access to a full on Dolby Atmos system to hear Ron's mixes. So how well, did you? Well, we, we, we had one disastrous experiment. Uh, <laughs> where, uh, because we, we, separated geographically quite a lot all of the producers of one kind or another and uh and apple arranged it such that we could all listen to a mix through the same soundbar and this is it the soundbar weighs more than my car the soundbar is it, huge uh, it's a sennheiser soundbar the damn thing is it's it's the size of a bumper yeah. it is it's just it, it's in, gigantic in, yeah. in its defense it does sound quite good oh it sounds but, great yeah. it sounds yeah. great. but but yeah. but ron you had some two channel it it was yeah, it, it, it was one of those experiments which sounded like, isn't technology wonderful? Hasn't the internet brought us all together? Uh, and was just utterly disastrous. You know, it's all based on broadband at that point when you're trying to play something from my room in New York for people in New Zealand, in LA, uh, who knows where else. And, uh, you know, hard copy. It's so much easier <laughs> to just send out you know, a, a quick time with a two track, that mix I could, I could trust, you know, having something sent out and then going into a sound bar, not even going into discrete channels, you know, who knows the algorithms being involved. I mean, it just, I'm kind of glad it ended up just being the two track. Um, I would check those mixes before I sent them anyway, and, you know, knew that they were going to be fine. So, you know, I've listened to the mix after the fact, and uh, I, I have a room that I can then, you know, listen to what's being played on Apple, and it sounds like my room. I'm very happy with that. So, so it, it basically, it, it was the, the the broad process was kind of uh, fell into a form of efficiency, which I don't think any of us had anticipated at the beginning because we were different, none <laughs> uh, different times of the day, and so on and so. On. And somebody always looked exhausted on every call. There was somebody because you know at any point in that process. Well, actually, I suppose in the in the mid crunch, nobody's getting enough sleep. So we're we're at different times of the day where nobody's got enough sleep. And I and I have to say, um, uh, Ron has an ability to extend not just patience but a sense of benevolence. It, it, if you if you you don't have to fear being an idiot, uh, but the the process was surprisingly efficient apart from that one hiccup with the soundbars which was uh yeah which which we like immediately just said nope not doing it anymore you, like that. you pivot you pivot to something else and you make it work but we should we should point out that this was a workflow that was sort of um forced upon you because of covid right you 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 were only my understanding is you were you you hadn't even finished production right when the the the, the shutdown happened so what you you had to go down for a while and then you came back and you finished shooting or how did that work neil it was um, logistically, and uh, I'm going to use some air quotes now. I've never done this before, so I, I warn you in advance, air quotes are coming. Uh, it was logistically and creatively challenging. Uh, we, would, we were halfway through shooting episode five in Mexico City when it simultaneously became clear to almost all of us over the world, oh, my God, this thing is quite serious. So without even getting a chance to say goodbye to each other, we all hopped on planes to our various destinations. You know, Melissa's off to France, Justin's off to New York, I'm off to New Zealand. And then the thing just kind of um, sagged like an old party balloon. We didn't know what the hell was going to happen to the world or to the show. And of course, because I'm uh, a self-obsessed narcissist, the show was much more important than the world at that point. Uh, you know, the the... the the pandemic was an inconvenience. It was rude. It was rude of God to intervene in the show in that way. Um, and yeah, and for a while it was, you know, uh, we, we, it was supposed to be a nine episode season and it became very clear very quickly that we weren't going to be able to do nine. Um, we weren't sure if we could remount in Mexico because we weren't sure about the, the COVID situation. We discussed um various alternative locations including at one point new zealand we looked at um just finding a studio in la we could finish it so logistically there was a lot of kind of pretzeling the brain 
I mean, I know, I know New Zealand is very facile and has a lot of different locations, but can you really shoot Mexico City and the Mexican desert in New Zealand? Uh, that, that, might, that might be a bit of a stretch. It turns out, you know, it, it turns out, I tried really hard to convince them that, you know, we could, uh, but no, sadly. Uh, one, uh, it would be nice to work at home at some point. But, but we remounted uh, under very strict COVID regulations. I say we, I was here. I haven't left the country since. Um, oh, so you didn't, you didn't go back no. to the additional, to the, that's amazing. Yeah, wow, yeah. that must have been very painful for you. Well, in some way, there, there's, a, there's a system called QTake, which allows me to monitor the set uh, live from my laptop, as it were. But uh, there, there was an old Victorian conceptual prison, which actually America uses in Supermax, in some US Supermax, called the Panopticon. And uh, the, the design of the Panopticon is such that you as a prisoner can be watched at any point, but you never know if you're being watched or not. Um, and so actually being able to watch the set meant that I never had to. <laughs> <laughs> the theory, you could be there lurking behind the lens. Knowing the power. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. Ex exulting in my... <laughs> Uh, well, we, yeah, so episode five, half of it shot in Mexico City with one director. The second half of it, uh, Guadalajara with a different director. And, you know, and our 15 year old member of cast had aged six months in the, in the, in the interim. So there was so much that could have gone so very horribly wrong. And I think that, I think the joins are essentially invisible. It's a pretty remarkable thing they pulled off. Ron, uh, he he brought up your your fifteen year old cast member who took a six month break. Did you have did you have did you have voice matching problems? Did it did he did he hit puberty in the in the middle of that? No, he 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 had he had done okay. Um, yeah, I don't think you notice too much. I mean, there's a height thing, but I I didn't notice anything with his voice. Um, you know, for us in post during the whole COVID thing, um, Apple was very cool. They let us. Because we, we had started, we had literally just started on the first few episodes and we knew that there were at least three, three and a half episodes ready for us when COVID hit. We all kind of went on a hiatus for a few weeks while New York City kind of got its act together. But then we were asked if we could, is there a way that we could come back and at least button up, button up with what was done? Like we had recorded Foley, we had sound effects cut, we had dialogue prep. We knew we were going to get another round of changes, but Apple said, look, if we get it, if we get it close to being ready and done, like pre-mixed, then when we do come back, it'll be able to get done within the time frame that we know we're going to throw you into. So, you know, we had a few weeks during COVID coming into the city. It was like, you know, going into a zombie massacre uh where everything was very empty and things were closed down and i'd go to my studio everybody else we'd you know sent our uh computers to so they could work from their homes and uh you know everybody's still at home they like it <laughs> i think i honestly think the industry is going to change in a big way um over the course of this but um yeah they were really cool and then we went on a long hiatus and then we came back and uh got things ready again for us to pick up where they left off. Well, one of the things I really loved about the show is, is that the episodes are broken. It's almost like chapters in the, in the, the fleeing to the mosquito coast, you know, story. And each one of the chapters or episodes seems to take place in a very discreet location. And that, that presents, I think some really interesting uh, possibilities for you, Ron, uh, in terms of the sound design and the mix. And, I, I, you know, there's so much that we could talk about, but I, I, I would love to just kind of spend a little time talking about episodes uh, three and four. That's the, 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 the crossing of the desert and then hanging out in the cartel house. Cause there's some really interesting sound things that are happening in both of those episodes. Um, episode three, I, I love because, or, or it's actually the end of episode two, but I love that there's a whole plot point that revolves around a sound effect, you know, that the, uh, that the, the popping, the, the water bottle that pops then creates the impetus for this entire shootout in the desert. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that, that episode three, which was kind of crossing the desert, um, and, and your approach to the sound of that? Cause it's, 
it's pretty sparse. You don't have a lot to hide behind. It's really, you know, you're you're kind of you're kind of exposed out there from a sound perspective. Did you hear that? Do you think they're looking for us? Everybody move! You know, Justin, his acting style is very quiet. You know, he, he'll be standing next to ocean waves and he won't be projecting at all. He, he draws you in that way. I mean, I think it's part of the character of Ali that makes you really like him is, you know, chaos and, and, and everything is going on around him. But he's still this controlled, quiet voice and everyone else around him responds similarly. So you've got a very, very quiet track all the time whenever they're talking. So we, uh, in, in episode three, um, you know, it, it, we didn't have any kind of an issue with a lot of extraneous sounds, uh, you know, but we still had our dynamics. We had winds all over the place. We had sand moving. We had, you know, footsteps on crackly rocks, on soft rocks. You know, we were, we had a lot of fun with that. Um, and we spent the time crossing the desert. We, you know, each location kind of became its own thing. And we, you know, we, we tried to make it hotter. <laughs> you know, we just tried to make it more uncomfortable as we went. And, uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think we pulled that off. A episode four that you bring up um, is, is purely Neil. Uh, Neil, wanted, Neil wanted another whole life happening within that uh, Hacienda, where the pipes were rattling, they were talking, they were a problem. So we, we basically had this house, but we had a whole lot of stuff happening behind the walls and in the ceilings and other places. And, and it did. It was like everywhere. You never had a place that didn't have some rumble happening or didn't have something going on. And it acted in counterpoint to what was actually going on in the in the scenes. A lot of times people were just talking, but there were things going on in the wall. You, you also had a, a great, um, I think, definitive insight, uh, which was not only the stuff in the walls, but we wouldn't hear anything natural when we were in the house. No birdsong, yeah. song, nothing else. Yeah. So any natural sounds in the environment would uh, solely the preserve of the exteriors. And I think that was, that was a definitive choice, actually. Because because there's a, there's yeah, cool. such a sense of uh, there's such a sense of unease in that hacienda, and I think eighty percent of that is dance the sand design. I think it's you know well it's it's the taxidermy feeling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, what's so great is because you cannot put your finger on what's what's wrong. There's just something a bit off in the environment. Yeah, it's I I love it. Well, I'm I'm so excited that you guys brought that up because I I, I really I, I didn't want to talk with you about that episode four and that sense of, mm. as you say, there's almost like a disconnect between what's happening. There's the there's the the text of the scene and then the subtext of the scene, and a disconnect between what's happening visually and and auditorially. And I love that it hadn't even occurred to me that inside the hacienda you don't hear any kind of natural sounds from the outside world, but you really use sound design in a way to in a very strong way to uh, to build that sense of unease and foreboding. And you just, you you know, you know that this is going to end badly by the end of this episode.
the great the great joy of that and and one of the things that i enjoyed about our kind of post-production process and not just its efficiency but it's kind of camaraderie is that to me is is ron is storyteller that that's ron not just understanding the story but being in the story and telling the story uh and that kind of and that 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 moves beyond kind of more air quotes it moves beyond collaboration and, it, and it's it's more this kind of joint ownership of the story and that's a that's a rare joyous thing to experience that's great neil um i spend a lot of time uh talking at film schools and lecturing and teaching and and oftentimes i'm asked to talk to uh talk about the power of sound for storytelling to writers and directors and producers because amazingly you know this is well, you know, what Ron and I do in, in the sound world is not often taught in film schools. Uh, and there are, it's kind of a gap in the education for a lot of filmmakers to understand how to use sound as a storytelling tool. So, you know, I'm just kind of curious for you if, uh, you know, when you have conversations with, you know, younger up and coming writers and, and directors and showrunners, what do you, what do you tell them about sound? What have you, what have you learned through your, through your years and your experience? Uh, well, on this? you know, the, the most, um the most important thing to learn i think is is always to work with people who know what they're doing and love what they're doing uh and understand what you want and also um as i say sometimes because i'm i'm really i'm almost completely ignorant of but fascinated by sound design uh and i'm acutely aware of how profoundly it can change the way that an audience engages with a scene or indeed a story. I, I think the sound design, again, in episode four is so in, incredibly vital to how an audience experiences that story without ever consciously being aware of it. And um, it's something which has fascinated me since I was very young. I don't, I never went to film school. I have no theory. I in fact have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I'm aware that to me, Britishness on film, when we talk about um, kind of kitchen sink realism in good British cinema from the mid 60s to the early 70s is almost all sound design. Uh, British films have a particular feel and it's got nothing, well, it has less to do with the cinematography than one might imagine. It has less to do with the accents than you might imagine. And it's got to do with a very particular oddly parochial soundscape. So it's a, it's a process that fascinates me. And I think um, writers particularly should be much more acutely aware of it because it helps you do your job. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to ask you to dig a little bit more on that. Well, how do, how, how does sound design help a writer do their job? Um, I, I think the, the kind of sound environment, and you know, I'm going to deploy cliches, no scare quotes this time, but cliches. Acting is reacting and, and a kind of sound environment gives an actor something to respond to. Uh, you know, my favorite piece, and this might be a cliche, guys, that, that, you know, you know this stuff infinitely better than I. But if you look at, you know, The Exorcist, it's, it's a masterpiece of sound design. And a, and a lot of that is, you know, is uh, uh, um, freaking being kind of improvisational and kind of knowing what would work and kind of not. But that film is scary, um, not because of kind of turning heads and masturbating with crucifixes or green vomit or anything else. It's almost entirely the sound. And there's a, there's a, do you guys know Vic Tandy? Mid to late eighties, I think. Um, Vic Tandy's an engineer working in the North of England. And in this, I promise this is relevant. <laughs> In this place where he works, all right, there's a there's a ghost, and there's a room where none of the personnel like to go when they're alone because they go cold, they experience rushes of dread, goose flesh. Vic Tan is an engineer; he doesn't believe in any of it. He's also a fencer, and one day after hours at work, he's got his sword, his very thin sword, on his desk. And he notices that it's moving. Uh, so there's some kind of resonance that's causing the, um, causing the sword to vibrate. So Vic Tandy tracks down the source 
of this resonant frequency, and it's about 18.5 hertz. And he tracks it down to a malfunctioning air conditioning unit, right? which he proceeds to fix. And as soon as he fixes it, the haunting goes away. Uh, 18.5 hertz, I believe, is right on the edge of human conscious hearing. And it's also the frequency at which a tiger growls. And a tiger is our main predator. So, so many of what we physically experience in terms of fear and anxiety is driven by something uh, so fundamental as the resident frequency of your environment. And, and indeed, freaking mixed tiger growls into the exorcist all the way down. Uh, and it, uh, uh, I'll shut up about this in a moment, but uh, coincidentally, it's also... Um, so if you play, if you if you uh, expose people to that frequency, they will experience anxiety, which leads to kind of um, uh, physical manifestation of anxiety, such as you go cold because you're, you know. But also by coincidence, it's the resonant frequency of the human eye. So your eye jelly starts to vibrate, and you start seeing things in the corner. Uh, that is extraordinary. Yeah. I've never heard that. It's a wonderful yeah. story. That's a terrific it's story. It's great. And so many hauntings are caused by, and you know, um, 18 frequency, 18 yeah. uh, Winter hertz frequency. Broken window That's resonating at 18.5. Um, underground mm -hmm. rivers, you know. That's great. Well, rumbles and low ends. That's one of our big design yeah. things for scary, yeah. evil, nasty moments. So, yeah. I do, I love the fact that it makes biological sense for us. But I love I love the way, Ron, that you use that all through the series. I mean, I was even struck by that that really remarkable sequence. I think it's in episode one when they're running and they end up in the basically in the in the homeless encampment. Um, which no, was it's in two. But oh, yeah. it is. Yeah. Which was sort of just a masterwork of production design, but it also gave you a lot of fun from a sound perspective, I'm sure. Yeah, and and scared the hell out of me because the conversation that Ali has is nice and quiet, <laughs> and we wanted to create this, you know, basic human version of hell in a lot of ways, where, you know, these are the castoffs, these are the, it, it's almost like purgatory, um, you know, and and Neil again wanted it to be busy, but at the same time we had to still hear Ali and we had to hear what was going on outside with the police and. You know, so there were a lot of little connections that we had to still make within the context of that area. So we we did a lot of stuff with um, with the reverbs of all those people talking that basically created that kind of bed of of rumble and and, you know, torture going on in the background. I'm sure, you know, COVID complicated things for you in terms of ADR and loop group and, and whatnot. I mean, how were your production tracks and how much ADR did you have to do and how did you do that during COVID? Uh, production tracks were, were pretty well recorded. Uh, we had a pretty good track on that for all our principles. Uh, but at the show is very busy. It needs a lot of group. So um, and Mexico got, and, and Mexico City group. You can't you get, you know, it's and very Mexico specific, City group, right? too. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Which which we ended up doing a lot in New York with, with a lot of, you know, Mexican actors and, and the like, but it, um, it was complicated and, and it's probably the same way it is for everybody mixing right now, any kind of group, it, it, it comes to you as individual channels, individual tracks a lot of times. So, you know, I'll have a group of 25 people, but I'll have 25 channels that I'll have to mix in. Nobody's in one room anymore participating in a group scene. Um, it takes longer. You know, it just takes longer to mix and it takes, you have to weed out more. The, some things that would normally be buried, but part of a background that you wouldn't notice, it now sticks out like a sore thumb because it's their own track, so. Ron, you mentioned that you mixed the, the show in, in Dolby Atmos. Was that uh, part of the, the thinking and the, the, then the design approach from the beginning of the process? And what did, you, what, what did Atmos allow you to do? What were some of the moments that you kind of leaned into that format? Well, I, I, for television especially, I, I just use Atmos as more speakers to be able to, uh, you know, pull you into a scene to envelope you. I still, you know, I, I part of my upbringing of storytellers in New York, the way mixers in New York would tell stories, it, it's on the screen. 
You know, it's not happening from here and there and it's up there. And that's kind of where the focus has to be. So, you know, for me, I'm always still focusing on that. Someone could walk off camera, sure. And that kind of thing we could have some fun with. But um, I didn't go nuts. There were places like the opening scene when you're going through a through, through an ice making machine. Uh, you know, you could have fun flying things around. But um, I don't do any objects. I mainly work with embeds. I'm I'm sure that you must have had a lot of fun with the overheads and during that last episode in the uh, the storm oh, drain, yeah. the storm drain sequences, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot going on up there, and you know we we actually um, this is you know through Neil too. You know we brought the pipes back uh, from episode four. Uh, they're down there in the pit, um, scaring the hell out of Charlie. So you know. There's a lot of little overlap like that where little things kind of keep showing up. Um, you know, it, it, it was good. I, I, I'm going to be really curious as to what we're going to do for next season because we've kind of, in a lot of ways, the, the sound job has become... Um, you know, very internal to a lot of the characters and a lot of the characters are, you know, kind of borderline insane <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> so, at the, so we've been starting to have a lot of fun like that. Yeah. Like with Charlie, you know, after he shoots, he, you know, things start happening to him just sonically. Um, you know, there's a lot of things happening sonically that uh, aren't normal. And we are, we are going to have, I can, <laughs> yeah. I can confirm that so we are going to have more pipes. This is a show with many pipes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You you heard it here Get first, your head folks. More, pipes. more pipes <laughs> in season <laughs> two. All righty. Pipes. Well, uh, that, that kind of tees up uh, one of my last questions, which is, you know, at the end of the show ends on such a, a really unsettling moment. You know, Allie still relentlessly optimistic as, as always, but... The family has been through a little bit of a trauma <laughs> as they as they follow him on this journey, and there's really kind of an emotional disconnect between Allie and the rest of the family as we as we as we finish things up. And it's I think that's a really interesting fertile engine for you to explore with season two, Neil. It really is, and um, the I'm I'm incredibly fond of that scene because that's one of the scenes where um, it, it feels like the perfect cap on the end of the season. But also, it was driven in so many ways by Justin. So I kind of I, I told him about the idea and what we were going to see and how we were going to, you know, um, play him against his family, and that they they're wearing very different faces. And uh, and we use a song at the end, which I hate. I I I hate the Beach Boys, and I particularly hate that song. And it was Justin's idea. And it's perfect because uh, it's so jaunty. It seems to underlie the kind of beginning of his descent into lunacy. So I, I spent, and it's such a fine choice that uh, I spent the next six weeks humming it every day. I was walking around the house humming Kokomo. And again, we, 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 uh, we uh, arced back to episode one and we planted it in episode one as a, you know. So things looked like we knew what we were doing and we didn't. <laughs> we made it all up as we went along. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I definitely, uh, that, that Beach Boys song at the end of the episode really, that just, it's such a happy song. And yet in that context, it just filled me with dread for what's coming next for these folks. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, it's a kind of it's. I always think of the Beach Boys as the music that you know a serial killer would be singing to you as he drove you off in his van. Well, maybe maybe <laughs> that's the, maybe that's the soundbite from this episode. I don't know. There's so many. <laughs> you've, you've given us. You've, no, let's go. You've given us. A, you've given no, us a wealth of material to work with here. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today to talk about Mosquito Coast. Neil and, and Ron, it was, it's, been a, it's been a real pleasure to dive into this show. Oh, it's sure. Thank you. thank you. 
Thanks once again to Neil and Ron for joining us for the conversation today. And thanks to our friends from Apple TV Plus who uh, put this conversation together for us. If you haven't had a chance to check out the Mosquito Coast yet, you can find it as part of the offerings on Apple TV Plus. We have links as always in the show notes. The first season just concluded, so you can binge all seven episodes there. And actually on the day that we recorded this conversation, the announcement was made that the Mosquito Coast has been picked up for a second season. So we have that to look forward to as well. If you haven't already, please make sure you are subscribed to the Dolby Institute podcast. We have a ton of exciting episodes coming up in the next few weeks that you won't want to miss. Our next episode will be exploring the ways in which the filmmakers behind The Queen's Gambit managed to make the game of chess incredibly interesting and engaging to watch uh, in that episodic series. And uh, it's a really fun conversation. You won't want to miss that one. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to our podcast. There are links to our dedicated podcast feed in the show notes or you can simply search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please consider leaving us a rating or a review on the Apple Podcasts app. It really helps raise awareness of our podcast so that we can continue to grow. Until then, thanks for joining us. This has been the Sound and Image Lab brought to you by the Dolby Institute. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry. Production support is by Taylor Hines and our production coordinator is Tristan Enriquez. Thank you for joining us.